Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to Living the Solution with Dr. Elena George. Today we have an exciting show, one I'm looking forward to. Uh, we're going to speak about something that I think is dear to most of us, and that's our relationship with God. And I'd like to segue into the power and what the churches are doing, because I think there's something in my mind, somewhat of a disconnect, and I want to speak with somebody who can speak to that and really give us a full view of the purpose of the church, how it's being used now, and what the state of our of our relationship with God and our church is. So we're going to speak with Mr. Jeff Lukens. He's a West Point graduate, a U.S. Army veteran, and conservative activist. Since leaving the Army, he spent more than 30 years in the corporate business world. During that time, he found Christ and became active in his church, most notably with the children's ministry. In 2011, he founded the Tampa Liberty School, which instructs children on our nation's founding values in a fun, VBS-style format. Service to God and country are his priorities. He has also served on his, on his county Republican Executive Committee Board and various Republican clubs and activist causes. He's a contributing writer to the American Thinker, American Free News Network, Renew America, The Thinking Conservative, and Canada Free Press. So, Mr. Lukens, I want to thank you so much for joining me today because I, our conversation in the world that we're living in now is very important. I, I thrive because of my relationship with God. And I think we really tend to take that for granted. So once again, thank you for your time because I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, I'm looking forward to it as well. And, and uh, I, I thank you for reaching out to me. Um, and as uh, we were preparing for this interview, I was listening to your interview of Dr. Jason Garwald and, uh, and you were talking about the connection between Christianity and humanism. And that is just the perfect lead in to what we're going to be talking about today and what I have, what I have my message to, to uh, give out. And, um, so I, I think I, I appreciate your, your activism and bringing this to light for the public. I think it's one of the most powerful things that we have on this earth is our connection to God. And it seems like there's an all out assault on people being proud of that. You know, there's people yeah. have gone underground because of it, but that's the strength. Right. You know, once you have that, nothing bothers you. I find whatever's coming at me, whatever, you know, message of trying to get me to take in and imbibe, I just not buying it because I see a bigger picture. So right. Right. when I was a child, the church meant a lot. I mean, we went to church Sundays and it just seems like it's in a different place now. So from your perspective, I'm, I'm curious to know, first of all, how you came to this connection and it will segue from there. I think that's a good place to start. Well, well I, I, um, I, I grew up in, in the church, uh, uh, but I, I fell away from it in my, um, my twenties and I was, uh, not a safe person. And, and then in my thirties, my late thirties, actually, I, I came to Christ and, and accepted Jesus as my Lord and savior. And since then, my, my life has been going in a new direction and, uh, the army values that I instilled for, or that was instilled in me for duty, God and country, um, that really carries over to the message of God to the wider world. You know, we are called, uh, not only to save other people to, to spread the gospel message, but to, to, to reach out into all the different um, areas where they should, where Christians should be active in the community. And unfortunately, um, in recent times, they have been, cho they've been, um, silent in the face of, uh, of much controversy because they didn't want to appear too political. And, um, so what's, what happens is the, the, um, public debate is often left without a biblical worldview. And I don't think that's what uh, Christ calls us to do. Um, the consequences of the passivity have contributed to the unraveling of American society. And now is we are way past time to end the silence. You know, what you said it strikes me, strikes a chord in me, because the churches are not trying to be political. But is that really true when you've, some of them have become 501c3s and have taken government money? 
isn't that taking a political stance? And so it's kind of hypocritical, I find. Well, um, I I, I can just say this. Uh, The the church, there's a lot of churches are really concerned about their tax exempt status and they're they're worried about losing uh, parishioners and uh, and they're worried about attacks from the community, the press. And so it's just easier to go silent. They, They busy themselves with uh, the gospel message, which is a good thing, but that's where it ends and it just stays inside the four walls of the church and it doesn't go out into the community at large. And this is the problem. We have, you know, we, we've seen a lot of problems in recent years, just in the past five years, really, where we have things like normalizing pedophilia, trafficking children for sex, sex sexually grooming children, encouraging transgender surgery for minors and promoting unlimited abortion and gay marriage. Now, gay marriage is actually legal now, but it is not the will of God, as the Bible tells us. And so we have to give that countervailing message to the public at large, even though a lot of people don't want to hear it. And, and Christians and the, and the churches at large, are, they shy away from that message, unfortunately. I would agree, but it seems like it's become more secular. Church becoming secular is counterintuitive to me. Oh, yeah. What happened to faith? If yeah. you're concerned so much with your tax exempt status and all these worldly things, what happened to stepping out on faith and leaning on God? It's just that would, I question that. Exactly. Uh, you know, we, they become comfortable with business as usual rather than leaning on God and living out their faith. And um, that that is the sad state of where many churches are today. I'm not going to say all of them. There's many, there are churches out there that are really engaging uh, their surrounding communities with uh, these messages. And, and uh, that's a wonderful thing, but it's, there, there are far too few of them. Uh, they have to, we have to grow their numbers. And honestly, I, I think it's going to take, you know, a new great awakening in this country. We've had, a number of, of great awakenings in the past. The first one was prior to the Revolutionary War. That's what people, they found, you know, they discovered, you know, rights from God and, and they enshrined it in the laws of this land. And then uh, that was a major transformation of our country. And then in the years prior to the Civil War, the abolitionist movement was really, um, you know, a, a, a church-born movement. And, and that was a, it was a second great awakening for this country. And uh, there really has not been a great awakening since then, but I dare say we are due for one now, and it should be like right now we should be engaging in, in these things because where we are going is into a very dark place, and uh, it's going to be the church that saves us through the grace of God. I couldn't have said it better. I know we're going to take a break in a minute, but the thought of something defining our relationship with God and each other. That's not the church. It's really, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit disheartening because the church in itself, that power that it has to bring people to God, and it's just abrogating that power <laughs> for worldly comfort or just to get along. This is not something that you can you know, just kind of go along and get along with. You have to take a stand and, and stand for something, don't you? Yes, you do. And, and people feel comfortable in church with their friends and, and, and fellow uh, Christians. And that's a good thing. But they, they have to be prompted to go out into the community and do more than just hang around with other Christians. They have to reach out to the lost and reach out to the least of the, of the country. And um, this is what the Lord calls us to do. And it is kind of overlooked in, in the many ways these days. That's unfortunate. But I I think you're right. I think we're at a point where you can't keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result when you can actually feel and see what's going on. On that note, let's take our first break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with Mr. Jeff Lukens. He's the founder of the Tampa Liberty School. And, you know, our education system, Mr. Lukens, is you know, it's on life support, it feels like. And oh, yeah. I don't know how parents do it, putting children into the public school system 
and literally losing control. You know, maybe about 20 years ago when they started that mantra of it takes a village to raise a child, I really didn't pay attention to that. But I think this is what we're seeing. The parental power is being stripped and it's being given to these corporatized school public health system. And you described a lot of things going off track, but it's being promoted, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, in fact, I have my daughter is a school teacher um, teaching elementary school, and and um, they burden her with so many different rules and regulations, state, federal, and local, that she doesn't know what to do half the time. And there's all kinds of discipline problems in the classroom, and and she's very limited on what she can do about it. And it really comes down to the children and their families, which are broken families in many cases, and and it's a dysfunctional situation. And it's all, and of course, you can't mention Jesus or God in the classroom. That's prohibited. So, you know, it's a secular solution to things, which is failing in a big way. And uh, that's the sad state of where our education is today. You know, for your daughter, I'm, I can imagine, do they even, do you know if they even are allowed to say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore? I mean, the clubs that are for Christian students are pretty much gone by the wayside. It's all secular now. Are people able yeah. to really go back and? I, I, you know, I don't know if they, um, if they are. Maybe if she, if she chose to do that, I don't think so. To be honest, I, I really don't know the the correct answer there. But I don't think they they don't do it anymore. Is is the bottom line? It's just not done. Uh, they just start their day with announcements over the loudspeaker, and then they start to class, and that's that's how it goes. Well, if you think about the church side of this. I want to delve a little bit because you mentioned that there are churches who are really more uh, individual, community-based. How does that differ? I don't know if you can answer this question, but the corporatized version of these churches, these mega churches where they're hooked in with the government, for example, taking in immigrants, housing people, getting basically being an NGO, <laughs> non-governmental organization and getting tons yeah. of money. How does that yes. change the, ma- the nature of a church? Well, in, it changes it. Uh, it, it becomes uh, another extension of socialism, which the church is really not meant to be. It, um, the, the, church, the church promotes uh, individual behavior, not a collective uh, covering by the government and and, and facilitating f- feeding and housing people on the government dime at the taxpayer expense. I mean, well, if people want to donate their own individual money for those things, then then that's a different story. But when it's taxpayer money that's doing this, it's it's it's, it's a whole different matter. And the churches really should not, you know, talk about division of church and state. Well, there's one area where I think it applies, and they should not be doing this. Um, and, and they should, if they want to, they want to care for the least in the laws, collect the money and, and, uh, on a public, uh, campaign and then, uh, take care of these people. Uh, but to take government money and then, and then they're, then they're, once they start taking that money, okay, maybe it's helping some people, but you know, then they're beholden to the government after that. And they're not, and, and the government doesn't care about the, the call of Christ. And they are, and their whole purpose as a church is diminished as a result. I mean, follow the money, right? Whoever has the pocketbook has the power. Oh, yeah. We know the government right. and the way it's been acting is not pro sure. God, not pro human sure. at this point. So if they're right. controlling the purse strings and they're muzzling what the what the pastor can say, you know, we're three years into this COVID crisis and the churches have not been. I wouldn't say they've been advocates for their parishioners, to put it mildly. And that's an example to me where if your bread and butter is being given to you by someone working against you, then that's not of God. I mean, it's not about, it's about the truth, right? Not about being duplicitous. There shouldn't be two ways or two, two ways to speak, two ways to be. It's only one way. How do we break people from that? Well, that's that's the big question that we must all search deep for. Um, I wanted to bring to to uh, the audience attention um, a book that I recently read uh, by Eric Metaxas, Letter to the American Church. And in this, he uh, he compares the um, the German Church of the 1930s to the 
to the American church as of today, where um, the German church um, could not have imagined uh, all the trouble that would lie that was ahead for them in the years ahead, like such as the Holocaust, even though they saw all the signs of it ahead of time. And um, then here we are today in America, we have all kinds of signs that are, we're going into a dark place ourselves. Uh, but, um, you know, we know what happened in the Holocaust and we have no excuse to see the parallels and what's going on here. And uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a person that was a, he was a pastor in Germany and he spoke out and, um, and he, he had a, a quote here, science in the face of evil is evil itself, not to speak as, and not to, not to speak is to speak and not to act is to act. God will not hold us guiltless. And that applies to all of us here today in America. I mean, we see evil all around us building, 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 and we stay silent. And uh, we're not to act, and, and we don't do anything about it. We look the other way. The government will take care of it. The point is God will not hold us guiltless. We need to speak up on that. And so Bonhoeffer paid for that uh, with his life, basically, and we hope we don't have that kind of persecution in America, you know, but we have to pray about that. But the church does play a critical role in shaping the ethical culture of the nation and must be a beacon of light in the surrounding darkness. We must be heard publicly now more than ever. I would have to agree. It's, it, it's, our, it's our responsibility. And it's right. also our responsibility, I would think, to put our attention on people, on things that are aligned with God. What's your thought of pastors? Like here in Georgia, we had uh, our senator who's a pastor, who's absolutely pro and anti-life, you know, uh, termination of pregnancies up until birth. That is completely, I don't even know how you can even call yourself a Christian and say something like that. How do we call people out on that? I mean, it's a it's a hard question to answer, but it just the seems people in the local community must do that, and they must know the Bible, and they must know what they're talking about. Because if they argue it in a humanist uh, point of view, they're going to lose. They have to argue it argue it from a biblical point of view. And um, you know, a lot of churches now have um, gay pastors and different uh, arrangements that are, are no longer. Uh, of of the Bible, and you see a you see splitting in a number of congregations as a result, and it's a really uh, it's really the act of it's Satan coming into our churches and and splitting us up, and the believers the, who are actually grounded in the Bible need to speak up on this. That these this is wrong. What's happening, and um, and we must we must speak and with all with with uh, all the force that we can muster on this. At the same time, you, you don't want to you don't want to come across as harsh because that turns people away. But you need to speak truth is what it's all about. And sometimes it's hard for some people to accept what the truth really is. Is there any value to withdrawing your consent and having your own church, your own home churches, and just removing yourself from the system? I mean, is it salvageable? Well. Um, that's always an option. Uh, you know, home churches are going to be small. It'll just be a handful of people. And, and really, we need to reach out to the large, larger community. And so you really have to probably have both speaking to the, the organized congregations and, um, and then home churches as well. It needs to be probably a combination of both. Um, I remember when I f first got saved, um, my wife uh, was in a parking lot and, and she was um, had a flat tire and a, a man came over to help her with her tire and turns out the man was a pre was a pastor and he, and she's oh where's your church and he pointed over there in the in the in the strip mall and he, there's there's um there's a grocery store there's a pizza place and then right there it said church <laughs> <laughs> and so well we went there the next uh, the next Sunday and uh, and it was a wonderful uh, service he gave and and. And it really got me thinking about God. That was that was in my where I started searching for the Lord. And um, and he actually uh, was the um, the officiating uh, person at our wedding. And uh, but 
but you know th that is a, that's kind of an example of a home church. I mean, you just you can start them up anywhere at any time, and and it does have a positive effect. And I'm living proof of that. I mean, who knows where the inspiration is going to come from, right? And that spark, that connection to the divine and gratitude. But you have to start yeah. somewhere. And sometimes it's less threatening when it is something that innocuous. It just opens you up. You know, it's, oh, yeah. we have, we're so, I think, distracted with so many things coming at us that are, they take your attention or worse yet, you don't want to face them because it's so horrible. So you just find something to distract yourself with. It comes down too to being brave, doesn't it? Oh yes, it takes lots of courage, and but you know, um, we we, um, we must be assured of the, that the Lord uh, is with us, and it's His battle, and we must overcome our own apprehension and and fight uh, the good fight with the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, there, there's a, a theory going about uh, about a, a spiral of silence, and Eric Metaxas talks about this in his book, where people um, they just you know, they assume that, okay, these are subjects we don't talk about publicly. We kind of keep to ourselves. It's, we are silent. And, and, and it's, it's reinforcing with the larger group of people. And once you have one or two people stand out and take a bold stand and they, and they have the power of God behind them, other people will join in and, and it's, the spiral of silence is broken. And that's where we are right now. That's where mm -hmm. we need to be right now is we've got to break that spiral. I think you're right. And all of the things with the censorship actually, I think, height, you know, heightened that inability to stand up and speak. Those that would and could were literally removed from the public square. Hopefully that's being reversed and people are now paying attention and feeling empowered to have their voice. I think that's extremely, I absolutely agree with you. On that note, let's right. take our second break. You're living in the solution. If you miss the show, you can catch it on drlanagegeorge.com, iTunes, Spotify, and a host of multimedia platforms. You can follow her on Living in the Solution on Telegram and Living in the Solution on Facebook. Subscribe and share it with your friends. You're listening to Dr. Elena George, Advocate for Living in the Solution. Welcome back to Living Solution. Again, we're speaking with Mr. Jeff Lukens, and prior to the break, I think you did a wonderful job of rounding out the power of the voice. The word is extremely important. And I think language has been absolutely used as a weapon over the past three years and more to make what's up, what's, you know, what's down, up, what's up, down, and to define people in a negative way so that they don't want to put their head up because they might, you know, encounter something that they don't want to. But yeah. When you feel, when God is with you, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Who cares if you're popular? Who cares if you've got likes on the internet? Who cares? That's what we need to get to. And Absolutely. education seems to be the most important thing. The Tampa Liberty School, tell us a little bit about that because it seems like it goes, it's old school. <laughs> it goes against the grain of what children well, are learning it, now. It, it is. Um, so... You know, we have a wonderful history in this country. Um, it's not perfect, but but we we were founded as a Christian, a Judeo-Christian nation, and our all our laws and our constitution was based on biblical text. And um, that message is rarely heard today, and especially with children. And so um, the idea came up that we would have a summer program that would be a week long. And it would be similar to how a, a VBS would work, Vacation Bible School. So we would have, and we called it the Tampa Liberty School because we're in the Tampa area. And this would be about liberty. And, uh, and it would be the age bracket of 8 to 12-year-olds. And um, instead of talking about Bible, Bible characters, we were talking about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Ben Franklin. And so... Uh, and it's amazing, you know, this is a message that really resonated with the kids. We made it fun. You know, we had a lot of games and we, and we, and we, we dressed up, you know, in costumes of that, you know, of colonial times. And uh, we, we actually had a, um, a reenactment of the crossing of the Delaware. 
<laughs> really what it was we had a, a little a little kiddie pool filled with water and then we put ice cubes in it so <laughs> and then the kids would wade into it they feel the cold water and I said, well, this is, the, you've got to remember, you're crossing this river in the, in the middle of winter to attack the Hessians on the other side of the river. And so we, and they, and, oh, the children, just got, their imaginations were going. And, and so it was, it was a lot of fun to do, to do this. And, and we talked, and we talked, first we talked about the, um, the, the, um, the, the founding with the pilgrims. Then we go into the, uh, the second day, we, we talk about the rising anger with, um, with Britain and 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 how there uh, a, a a war was coming on and then we, we the third day we talk about the war the revolutionary war itself and then the fourth day is um uh we talk about the constitution and it kind of follows the timeline of what happened and and then on the on the on the fifth day we we have role playing and we have we have three different um stations and and one one is tea with the president and so so we're dressed uh, I'm, I'm i'm dressed up as george washington and we got a lady with a dress on and she's uh, Martha Washington and we have uh, other uh, colonial people at the table and, and we get the kids come in and we, we have prearranged questions and they ask us a question like, you know, uh, did, um, wh were you really scared when, when you crossed that river uh, and fought the, fought the British and, and, and our, or what was it like to be the first president of the United States? And of course we knew what the questions were. So we, we had an answer for everything and, and, but the kids just loved it. And, and, uh, just nothing but rave reviews on this and this started back in 2011 and we've been doing this um maybe two or three times a year uh ever every year since and um the covid kind of set us back a little bit but uh that that's just a it was just a, a, an initiation there's i mean it's, it's all volunteer the adults are all volunteers and they're they want to help and they want to engage the children and there's and we're talking about the Christian basis of our country at the same time, we're going through all these historical events. And so they see, they can see the tie in between Christianity and the founding of America. And, uh, and it, it's really, it's a wonderful thing. We've had other, we've had a lot of people call us up from other locations and they want to get our curriculum. And uh, it's, it's been just a, a blessing for the kids that have gone through it. And a lot of kids have been through the program like three or four times. They love it so much, you know, so uh, it, it's a lot, it's a lot of fun doing it. I got to say. Well, anything can spark a child's imagination and bring them in, you know, it, yeah. it's something that you never forget and it gives you a foundation. You know, as you said at the beginning, nothing's perfect. There is no perfect country. But right. The, it's the striving for perfection that's important and not giving up on it and having the foundation, Absolutely. which is freedom. And that's the key. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think for Christianity too, when you think of how, what it is, it's about choice. It's about freedom of choice, freedom of will, liberty. Right. That's really what Christianity is. We try, everybody tries to paint it as being very authoritarian, very, but it's actually not. It's people taking responsibility, having a relationship with God that they choose and, and spending energy to grow it. It's not just something that right. it happens to you. I think that's really the most powerful thing I find about Christianity, sure. we need to sure. actually, I think, educate people about that. I think so. I agree. I agree. And and it starts with children as much as you can reach them. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of people grow up and they don't, don't even hear about it. And then they become like myself. Uh, uh, we get, we get converted as adults and, and that's, it's hard to happen. It's hard to happen with, with adults. It's usually when they're like a teenager or maybe even five or six years old, they they come to Christ at that age if they if they're in a good family environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you, you know, so I was fortunate that God pulled me out of all the mess I was in uh, and reached out to me and and embraced me at at a you know an age of thirty eight. Oh, it's so. never too late, is it? No. <laughs> and it's never too late to actually get your 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 power back. There's something really comforting about not being, you know, bandied about by emotional, you know, headwinds. It's either you're depressed or you're happy. You're going from one extreme to the other, but there's no center or balance. And I think that's maybe by design, right? Because if you're never in a comfort zone that you can take stock and you can have a sense of self, then you're really going to be set up for whatever's coming at you, whatever oh, yeah. prevailing you know, emotion that they want to use to control you. 
You can't be controlled if you right. have a center. And, you know, this reminds oh, yeah. me of this straight moral relativism that we're dealing with. There is nothing sure. relative about morality. And the church seems to have been pulled into that, don't you think? Oh, yeah, I believe so. Um, and that's and that's basically the reason why they they keep silent, because they don't know how to address it or they minimize the biblical message because they don't want to offend all the relativists out there. And, you know, we have to speak the truth and, and do it in a gentle way, but, but the truth still has to come out. Because, I mean, are we, do we fear God over man or vice versa? And so uh, people are looking for leadership, and, and they, don't, they don't want passive churches. They want churches that um, will stand up there and, and speak truth to power. And, and those are the ones that are, those are actually the churches that are growing. A lot of churches are losing people, but the churches that are actually growing are the ones that are, 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 are bedrock uh, messages there, and, and they're reaching out into the community, and that's, uh, that's what it's, uh, people respond to. I was going to ask you that. That's a, that's an excellent, you know, path that people are on. I think people are figuring out. It seems to me what's artificial, and what is just kind of pablum. It's not, it's not moving people anymore. We're in such a position. It's almost like flight or flight, right? Fight or flight, where you have to oh, have yeah. something to yeah. really tangible to hold on to. I think we're right. coming to the point that it's not. Hollywood. It's not the politicians. It's not, you know, right. temporal things that mean nothing. It's a bigger right. picture. Right. And, you know, America was established with the um, capacity for people to speak and reason freely. And, uh, and we need to address our elected officials and give them the biblical uh, viewpoint on the laws that they're trying to pass. And, uh, and we need to debate vigorously. I mean, the left takes full advantage of their freedom of speech. I mean, why don't we? No. And, um, and we, need to, we need to engage in this way or it's just going to become too late at some point. I mean, the, the country will be too far gone. And so that's really what we're up against. I mean, this, the slide has been going on way too long and we are coming from behind and we need to, we need to catch up and, and right the ship, so to speak. Is there anything that you think that we can do that, that moniker, that Christian nationalist moniker that seems to have been conflated with you know, terrorism, et cetera? That's what, okay, so the progressive elites, they always, uh, okay, oh, you're just a Christian nationalist. But you know what? God calls all nations to themselves to, uh, to honor God. And and that and if we're so we're just doing what God calls us to do, so and that, and all the other nations of the world should be doing the same as well. So I mean, you know, what's wrong with that? You know, I don't have. They can call me a Christian nationalist all day long, and I will say you're right. So I don't, <laughs> you know, I'm not worried about it. You know, so and you know, um, and and basically. You know, uh, John Quincy Adams once said that um, duty is ours, results are God's. Okay, so, you know, we don't have to, um, it's not our responsibility to change the, um, the culture, change the government, but it's our duty to do our part and speak the word and, and, and tell, tell them what's right and what's wrong. And God will do the work and he'll fight our battles for us. So this is why I encourage people to get involved in the community, vote, speak the truth against falsehoods. And it, you know, if you believe the creator endows us with certain inalienable rights, including freedom of speech, now is the time to be heard. You know, so we're really all called for a time such as this. And we're going to take a break in a minute, but I want to start the question about being godly versus being secular. And I'm speaking specifically about what you mentioned, not just voting, but going into public service. Is there something, is there a disconnect? Is that, is that mutually exclusive, the way the system is set up? And I'll let you begin the answer. Actually, you know, bring in the answer after the break, because I I'm, don't want to cut you off, but that would be my question. So let's take our last break and come back. You're living in the solution.
Welcome back to Living the Solution. Before the break, I I was questioning whether is it mutually exclusive to love God, to be one with God and enter this cesspool <laughs> of politics, whether that's local or national? Well, yes, you can. I mean, and we use uh, Jesus as our example. I mean, here he was uh, speaking the truth and speaking the the word about the heavenly uh, will of God. And he was in the middle of the cesspool himself and the cesspool finally crucified him in the end. And, um, but that, but he, he had victory over that when that was all over. So, okay, well, we, we're not, we hopefully we're not going to be crucified, but we, um, we, we use him as our example that we have to engage the the lost world and shine the light on what is what is right and what is wrong, and you do it in a in a in a nice engaging way. You don't have to be stern and and angry with people, but you have to speak the truth. And um, Christians have a um, a caricature that people carry that oh yeah they're the angry and they're fed up and this and that. Well, you know maybe inside we kind of think that sometimes but we can on the on the outside we have to be engaging and we have to um keep a smile on my face on our face even when it's a real serious situation uh, we have to um do our part a lot of churches to their credit now are starting to get involved in in some ways they they're they're forming prayer groups in front of abortion clinics and um and things of this nature and I, I I totally support that, and, and and I salute the people who are willing to go out and do that, because that is the kind of attention that needs to be drawn to these areas. I I know that a lot of churches are you know they're they have active Wednesday night programs, and and there's like Christian citizenship training programs that you can take during this this time, which would be helpful. There's a, there's a number of different. Um, uh, curriculums that you could follow, and um, and they're they're all good. How how we were founded as a Christian nation, the five thousand year leap is a great book, a great resource, and a and a great. There's a whole training program around that book, and it's it's wonderful. So uh, school boards are another area where people are really becoming engaged in with with the sexually explicit books that are in the middle school libraries. Mm-hmm. And um, they're trying to get them removed. And this is a big issue in Florida that uh, the governor has now gotten on our side. And so um, we are in there. We're in the process of going through all the books in their libraries and and and, re- and we have volunteers volunteering to read these books. And when they find something that is inappropriate, they flag the book and, and then um, we go to school board meetings and try to uh, get that book removed from the library. And so these are all things that that are long overdue, and, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. But uh, th- again, the, que- the question is, are, are, are we living in truth or are we living in silence, you know, for God's message? Are we, live, are we are following his will? And, and I, I really hope and I really think this is a, the dawn of a new great awakening. And, um, and so I, we just have to all do our part, do our duty. So to speak, and um, and just raise the raise the issue on, on and raise the visibility of these things in the public sphere. You can't just stay around other Christians who already agree with you and think you're you're solving anything. You have to go out and reach the lost, and that's always um, not always, but it, it's it's sometimes an unpleasant thing, and uh, we have to, uh, but we have to do it. We're called to do that. It's what the Lord calls us to do. I think you're, what you described at the beginning of the show, you have to have another voice in this arena. Because if you don't speak up, then no one, right. there's got to be someone who's not speaking up, right? You're not alone. And the fact that All somebody right. says something, it really does empower the people who are a little bit more standoffish to get off the off their duff and actually do something. And when there's some people who just need to not be the only one, right? And I'm sure... I mean, most of us in this world really are good people, love God, want to help each other. And somehow this malevolent force has driven that, that ability or that want to, to speak up and just do it. It's driven it underground. But 
there's nothing more sanitizing than light <laughs> and truth. And it everything right. that tries to thwart it really does crumble and cower when people are really forthright and aggressive about doing the right thing. I don't care if that whatever it is in healthcare, in school system, in church, everywhere. I mean, it's just we've seeded the ground and we've let somebody control the narrative. We know the truth is we just need to speak it. I absolutely agree with you. It's nice to hear that because it gives you like just a feeling of there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with right. speaking truth. It seems like we're afraid mm -hmm. to do it, but if you continue to be afraid, nothing will change as you described. We are going into a, a new age that could become a very dark time in history. You know, uh, talk about humanism, but then there's the next level, which is transhumanism, where they actually implant chips in people's brains and they genetically enhance these people. You talk about the, uh, the, the Holocaust in Germany, you know, we're going to, we're, we're about to create a super race of people that are just incredibly intelligent and then live forever, so to speak, maybe 150 years or something. And, and, uh, you talk about, um, you know, you, you, this is the realm of God of, of where people live and what they do. And, and we think we can supersede how God creates us by, by creating people like this. And, and, and we are just getting started with it. As the, the technology advances, it's going to happen unless the Christian people stand up and, and say, no, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot that's, that's coming. And a, a particular individual who uh, owns an electric car company is really big behind all this stuff. And, and, um, it, and he's just one of many people who are, who are embracing it. And so, that, and so this is what our future is going to look like. Of uh, the Christians stay stay silent going forward. We need to stop it right now. I absolutely agree with you. A, yeah. And so this is just one of many areas. It starts with on a local level, but you know the 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 longer view becomes very very dark if if we don't stand up now and take a take a stand. Well, I think if we take a step back on that whole transhumanism argument, first of all, it's marketing. Number one, it's made by man, so it cannot be perfect. It's not better than God ever. Right. You know, we're seeing this in terms of healthcare, where they're trying to inject whatever into how many people they can get it into, but it's still not fixing the problem. It still doesn't stop no. the situation. And the immune system no. that God made is outstanding. It's flawless, and it's able to do run rings around what man is able to produce. And for those who think living forever is going to be awesome, let's just say, let's face it, it's not for everybody. It's only for a select few, not for everybody. Right. That's the whole point of this of this exercise is to get rid of everybody so that it's less resources being consumed so that they can have it. <laughs> so right. for anybody who thinks it's going to bring raise the boat for everybody, I got news for you. We're seeing how this works now. It's the lowest right. common denominator, and it's getting rid of any competition and it's mercenary, and it's the opposite of liberty and freedom of choice and God. Exactly. They don't want that. They exactly. can't compete with it. You talk about equality of of uh, all the all the races and all the gender and 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 everybody. Well, here they're actually designing people who are superior straight out, <laughs> and they think there can be and they can and that's the acceptable solution. And you know that's not going to have a good ending wherever it goes. No. It's going to be a mass extermination of the people who are unfit in their eyes. Well, so yeah, and they get to decide who's unfit. Remember that, right? right. So it's yes, not exactly. it's who you are, what you look like, what your station in on this earth is that they get to deem, uh, as they did during COVID, the essential and the non-essential. Right? They decided that. Yes. Did it work? Exactly. No. <laughs> Will it no. work? No. <laughs> And no. for those that think climate change and CO2 is the, the way to go, let me tell you, the biggest CO2 producers are humans. So if they want to lower the CO2, it's not driving cars. It's not putting you in electric vehicles. It's getting rid of people. Let's be honest and stop with the it's trendy and someone, someone says it so it must be true. Do your research, folks. Go back to basics and go back to the Bible. Go back to God in that relationship and then start thinking about what you're being told. I think that would do wonders, wouldn't it? 
Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The Bible has uh, has so much to offer. And in fact, the very first uh, verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And either you believe that verse or you don't. And that is really how the world breaks out. Um, we who believe that God created the heavens and the earth will follow him and we will follow the light. Those who don't are are going into a world of darkness. It's just how it is. Well, I'm hopeful that as we speak truth, that there will be more people who are don't know and who can be, you know, how can I put it, be brought into the light with us, you know, who are oh, not, yeah. have, so many people are unhappy, but they don't know what, where to go, what to do. And you're right. It's our job to educate, enlighten, to, you know, bring people to God. That's why we're here on this earth. I think that's our purpose. And I know time yeah. goes so fast, but I want to make sure people know how to read your, your articles and how to find your work. Okay. Um, if uh, you go to J E F F L U K E N S Jeff Lukens dot com, and it'll take take you to the Renew America website where I have the full cat- catalog of uh, articles I've written. Um, Amer- I submit to American Thinker as well, and I'm I'm batting about fifty percent there <laughs> at American Thinker. They don't accept everything I send in. <laughs> But um, the, the the full range of everything I've done, including my own personal testimony, is 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 at my my website j e f f l u k e n s dot com. Mr. Lukens, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. I feel empowered <laughs> to tell you the truth. Oh well, thank you, thank you, Doctor George, and I and and I am so glad to have met you and and spoken with you, and I am going to look forward to listening to more of your podcast going forward. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I want to thank you, and I want to thank everybody for living in the solution. Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Liberty Talk FM.